The Older Testament elder was a man who had arrived at the final stage of male development. The Newer Testament elder who shepherded the followers of Jesus had to meet the same qualifications. At one time, you probably were part of the religious system of control and power that separates people into clergy and laity classes. The privilege and responsibility of each follower of Jesus as a priest before our God is suppressed by the system called Nicolaitanism. The role of clergy is broadly accepted in Christendom, even though it has no biblical basis. The entire topic is too comprehensive to deal with in a video. So throughout this topic, we'll refer you to explore resources so you can thoroughly discuss this issue. What has been passed along over the centuries is a clergy system that was adapted from pagan Greek religions. In religious systems, men with the most personal charisma, education, or the greatest natural abilities are esteemed as the great leaders. You need to know this. Having someone come between you and God as some sort of professional holy man impedes you from fulfilling your kingdom responsibilities to be God's blessing. And depending on any one person lessens your sense of individual responsibility for personal and communal righteousness. Biblical elders can't be holy for you so you can continue to enjoy sin and gratify your own selfish interests. Keep in mind, as you establish Hebraic practices in your own fellowship family, don't reproduce a religious system in which the will of God and spiritual guidance from above are extinguished. Body life grows and deepens through the discussion and application of God's Word by at least two or three in the presence of Jesus. Beware the destructive effects of rule number three. The vested interests of those who run the religious establishment have left a lasting mark on today's congregations and may affect the life of your home fellowship family. A vested interest is a hidden agenda behind actions that seem good but have unforeseen consequences. Vested interests can influence your fellowship family if you aren't on guard. In fact, vested interests affected the very Bible many people use today. The translators of the King James Version were required to follow Bancroft's rules of translation into English. Rule number three of Bancroft's rules stated that the old ecclesiastical words were to be kept. Bancroft's rule number three reinforced the connection of the word church as a structural hierarchy. This eliminated the true meaning of ecclesia as the people, the called out ones, which is the more relational Hebraic understanding. Because of Bancroft's rules, the word pastor was inserted into both the Older and Newer Testaments instead of the more precise word shepherd. This substitution reinforced an ecclesiastical system of clergy hierarchy. Clergy hierarchy nullifies the Hebraic basis for relational shepherding, personally leading others as extended spiritual family. We're saying this so you won't try to establish a clergy system of leadership in your home fellowship. Psalm 23 vibrantly depicts the personal devotion and interaction our Father requires of His shepherds and is the example of our chief shepherd, Jesus. A biblical shepherd sees that the needs of the fellowship family are met, offers a safe atmosphere in which the fellowship can interact without fear or domination or humiliation, encourages the one anothering in which the sheep refresh each other in their Lord, makes clear the boundaries of righteous living so that the name of Jesus will be uplifted before others continues to direct those in crisis toward a deep trust in their Lord that overcomes all fear. Undoing the effects of rule number three, shepherding God's way. What was God's purpose for the apostles, evangelists, prophets, and shepherd teachers that Paul mentions in Ephesians chapter four, verse 11? To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God 
and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. In segment one on the Home Fellowship, we discussed the all people's perspective of Abraham. This priority was reinforced by Jesus and passed on to his followers. Isn't that specifically what apostles, prophets, evangelists, and shepherd teachers are to do? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, and shepherd teachers are to prepare God's people for works of service as each person grows in Christ's likeness. Paul had no need to define these service roles since they were already present among the Hebrews before the coming of Jesus. And the enactment of these roles was well known among the first century Hebraic stream of Judaism. These anointed functions, which had been established before the coming of Jesus, cooperated to help people mature in Jesus and to attain his fullness. Let's go over the Hebraic understanding of each of these. An apostle was a person sent forth to an appointed place on a mission. An apostle today is used by our Lord to complete a specific mission. Our ministry is apostolic in that we are commanded by our Father to share the Hebraic foundations. Among the early church, the twelve, then Paul, received special commissioning from Jesus. But other believers were also called apostles, Andronicus and Junius, Barnabas, Silvanus and Timothy. An apostle isn't a position of dominance but an opportunity to carry out a spirit-directed assignment. An evangelist was a planter and repairer of faith communities. A biblical evangelist not only shares the gospel, but also gathers together a faith community which he'll leave in the responsible care of elders. Timothy and Titus were evangelists and church planters. Paul encouraged both these men in their evangelistic duties as they planted faith communities. But you, keep watch in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you might set in order what remains, and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. The so-called evangelists of today who do drive-by crusades aren't walking in the pattern of the early church planners of faith communities. The true evangelist started faith communities and helped to repair problems they encountered. Many of Paul's letters in the Newer Testament address specific problems in the different faith communities that he or Timothy or Titus had planted. A prophet was one to whom and through whom God spoke for the benefit of his people. Prophets generally operated beyond the confines of the Hebrew synagogue. Paul expanded that function to include prophetic messages shared within fellowship gatherings as well. Prophetic gifting is God's means to help the followers of Jesus stay absolutely true to His commands. Prophets are also our Father's forewarning voice, as when the prophet Agabus warned of an impending severe famine. A shepherd was a gray-bearded man of leadership who imparted wisdom and counsel to a specific group of people. We'll discuss the true nature and character of a biblical shepherd in upcoming topics. But for now, we can assure you that he wasn't a clergy person, and he never came between our Heavenly Father and his children. A teacher rightly divided the word to bring clarity and to exhort people to action. Through discussion of God's word, he helped people apply it to their lives. The true call of a spiritual shepherd was to role model and teach the way of the Lord. We'll explore the Hebraic teaching style in future topics, but know this. Teaching had everything to do with interpersonal discussion and nothing to do with pulpit lecturing. Our Father intended that these four anointings of apostle, evangelist, prophet, and shepherd teacher continue. Through this equipping, his purpose for his children to be a blessing to all people would be fulfilled. Notice the connection between shepherd and teacher is consistent with other passages. Now the overseer must be able to teach. 
Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard in speaking and teaching. I was a counselor to clergy for many years in southern New England. A number of the young men who were employed as pastor were really evangelists, planters of faith communities, and repairers in the early church mold of evangelists. So many of these men experienced difficulties in their ministries because God's goal for them was to share the gospel, plant the faith community, and move on and start another one. The care and training of each flock was to be left to the shepherds, the older men of wisdom in each established fellowship. These distressed men had been trained to fill the wrong role because their seminaries hadn't understood the Hebraic basis for the distinct roles of evangelist and shepherd. So many of these men were burnt out. They were trying to fill the position of pastor because they felt that was what they were supposed to do. But their spiritual gifting and anointing lay in other areas. The Hebraic understanding of the giftings and roles of Ephesians 4.11 has been lost to Christians for centuries. If you recall, Hebraic practices and Hebraic roots were severed after Greek philosophers converted to Christianity in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. So be prepared for vast shifts in your understanding in the segments to follow. Here are a few questions for you to discuss. How might your experience with professional clergy and steepled buildings impact the outworking of your home fellowship? How can you see the four gifting roles described in Ephesians 4.11 operating effectively in your fellowship family? In what ways could the elders in your fellowship family help equip each of you to more effectively use your spiritual gifts?